What makes North Carolina special? What do we all enjoy? What do we sometimes fear? But what can we not do without? The answer to each of these questions is the same, water. And that's our story today on Exploring North Carolina, the history and future of water, too much and too little. With 17 river basins from the mountains to the coast, each averaging more than 40 inches of rainfall per year, we are indeed fortunate. Water gives us our beauty and sustains our vitality, our ecosystems, our cities, and our economy. It is water that carves gorges, shapes our beaches, floods the marsh that feeds our fish and birds, and provides us with recreation and employment. Few places on earth are as fortunate as North Carolina when it comes to water. Today we are privileged to have four leaders and scholars, but perhaps most of all, people who care about the future of water resources in North Carolina. They include Bill Ross, who served as the secretary of the North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources for eight years. You will also meet Amy Pickle and James Salzman, professors and researchers at Duke University who understand water issues here at home and in other parts of the world. Finally, you'll hear from East Carolina University professor Stan Riggs, who knows the intricacies of North Carolina's coastline better than anyone I know. I asked Bill Ross, who, in addition to his public service, is currently a visiting professor at Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment, to state succinctly why we must pay attention to water in North Carolina's future. A wonderful quote about uh, the importance of water was provided by the author Barbara Kingsolver in a recent issue of National Geographic. I love this quote. She said, water is life. It's the briny broth of our origins, the pounding circulatory system of the world, a precarious molecular edge on which we survive. Uh, water is a resource that's both precious and finite precious because life depends on it. Uh, we can't survive without it. Finite because there's a limited supply. The amount of water on earth doesn't change. And in fact, less than 1% of the water on earth is accessible for human use. When you add to that the fact that uh, competition for water is increasing around the globe and around our state as a result of growing populations and pollution the situation becomes even more urgent. Although Bill Ross knows as well as anyone the water resources found in North Carolina today, he is also very much aware of water-related problems in our immediate past. To understand how important water is to the future of North Carolina, it's helpful to look at the past. The School of Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill has records of a survey of tenant farmers in rural North Carolina taken in 1923. None of the 175 tenant farmers surveyed had running water. Only eight of the 175 had a, a privy, even an outdoor one. So at that time in our state, the conditions mirrored what you'd find today in rural Somalia. And back then in North Carolina, in, in rural North Carolina, people were dying from those conditions as cholera pandemics swept across the state and other parts of the nation. Even in the 1950s and 60s, it was common for sewage and industrial waste to be discharged directly into our rivers and streams. Rivers from the mountains to the sea were in trouble in North Carolina. There were some rivers that you could smell before you saw them. For example, the Hall River in Piedmont, North Carolina was declared essentially dead in the late 1960s. Although we may have had water problems in the past, few states or nations on the earth would not trade places with North Carolina when it comes to water. The great thing about the position North Carolina finds itself in is that comparatively speaking, 
we have uh, water resources that other parts of the world and the nation don't have. But the last 15 years have shown that there are plenty of reasons for us to continue to place a priority on water. There have been plenty of, of examples of either too much or too little water that demand our attention and management. I then had the privilege of asking Amy Pickle and James Salzman to offer some perspective on North Carolina's water situation compared to other states and nations of the world. Amy Pickle is director of the state policy program at Duke University's Nicholas School for Environmental Solutions. Her work includes water management initiatives and climate change. James Salzman holds two chairs at Duke University, one in the School of Law and the other at the Nicholas School of the Environment. He is an expert in both international and domestic environmental law. Salzman's latest book is Drinking Water, A History. So we have certain assumptions living in North Carolina about drinking water, and it turns out that for most of the world, those assumptions are completely reversed. So in North Carolina, when we want some water, we go, we turn on the tap. We don't worry about the quality. We don't worry about the quantity. I mean, we fill our swimming pools with drinking water, and it's not our responsibility. It's either the city or it's some water utility that's taking care of it. In the developing world, the exact opposite is the case. Drinking water quality is not a given. In fact, uh, well over half, it's estimated that well over half of the folks who live in the developing world will suffer from serious waterborne disease at some point in their lives. Over a billion people do not have access to clean drinking water on a regular basis. So safety isn't a given. Quantity isn't a given. For much of the developing world, the water that you get is the water that you carry. Right? A lot of people do not have access to, to faucets and to infrastructure. And then finally, responsibility is personal responsibility. The water that you drink is the water that you get. There are a lot of studies done in Africa, parts of Asia, and they find that people spend up to three or four hours a day collecting water, and it's almost entirely women and girls who are doing this. North Carolina has a tremendous variety of options for dealing with water scarcity in the future. Unlike the rest of the world, you can go across the state and turn on an outside spigot and have clean, drinkable water. That's not true for the majority of the planet, where you are walking two, three miles for a few gallons of potable water to bring back to your residence. So we have built, as has much of the country, an incredible infrastructure to clean that water, to move that water, and to have individual access to the water at our residences. From Jim Salzman and Amy Pickle, I also wanted to know if North Carolina's position, compared with other states, makes us immune from water problems in the future. So is North Carolina immune from water problems? No, uh, and there really are, are three trends we need to focus on. The first one is population growth. Everyone who does projections sees North Carolina as a state that's going to grow in population. So there are going to be increased demands uh, for water. Uh, the second issue is infrastructure. We've been blessed with a lot of water and so we haven't made the basic infrastructure investments in terms of large res reservoir capacity, in terms of pipes to move the water from one place to another that we're going to need. And the third really is a way of thinking, right? We've taken water, abundant water, for granted, right? That may have been the case in the past. It's unlikely to continue. Uh, and one drives the other, right? If we're not going to basically recognize the need that we have for increased water infrastructure, then we're not gonna pay for it either. And you don't, you don't get one without the other. Although per capita water use has been declining over the years, and North Carolina has made great strides in inserting a conservation mindset in its citizens, the overall population is likely to increase. And our population centers for many parts of the state are located in the headwaters of some of our greatest river basins. Those headwaters are areas of low water resilience. It's not a place that you have a large flowing river. It's the really, it's the beginning of that riverine system. And those riverine systems don't have the level of um, sustainability that you do farther downstream. So when you increase your population in an area that doesn't have the resilience to support it, you're going to have water stress. So for the triangle in particular, and the triad, which are the headwaters of the Noose and the Cape Fear, those areas are looking for, they need to look for ways to increase their resilience. I asked both of our experts 
what we can do as individuals to offset potential water problems in our future. So there are things that anybody can do, including installing rain barrels, capturing your own water for watering your lawn, install, installation of cisterns, preserving buffers for both wildlife and for picking up the dirt that travels off the, the fields in a rainstorm, has um, dramatic impacts for our estuarine system, for our riverine system. So if we all are conscious of how our individual actions accumulate downstream, then we can certainly offset some of the impacts of our more more industrialized nation. Individuals have a big role to play in terms of, of water, uh, water conservation. Uh, and this is similar in many respects to most environmental problems. You look at what one individual can do in terms of turning off a light or driving less, it doesn't seem much. A lot of people do it, it adds up. So what can we do about water? Well, the first thing is individual consumption. Right, so for example, low flush toilet, putting bricks in your toilet. Um, toilet flushing actually uh, is, is, a huge, is a huge consumer of water, making sure your dishwasher is full when you run it, making sure that your washing machine is full when you run it. And there are a lot of other small things that, that, that one can imagine. The second aspect, I think, is basically the idea of a water consumer as a water citizen, and the fact that your vote and your political voice matters. The key thing is that we as citizens, as water consumers, need to understand times have changed. In the era when water was abundant and cheap, that's changing, right? We're in a new era today, and it needs to be basically to change the way we think about these issues. When examining the future of water in North Carolina, another question on the mind of many North Carolinians is hydraulic fracturing, better known as fracking. I ask Amy Pickle about the potential effects of fracking on water quality and quantity. Hydraulic fracturing is an a technique that's used by fossil fuel extraction industry to remove natural gas from a rock formation. Currently the way it's done through most of the country, it is a water intensive event. That's three to five million gallons per well. And depending on the number of wells, it can, and when those wells are drilled, it can be quite acute of a stressor for a particular system. And we don't know what the resource in North Carolina is likely to be or the number of wells we'll, we'll likely to have or the pace at which those wells will be developed. But it certainly has the potential to draw from the river systems, the surface water systems that we have in the state. And potentially, if it's done at the wrong time or in the wrong way, it has the potential to impact the quantity of the water or the quality of the water in the region. Over the years, I have had the privilege of spending time on the North Carolina coast with Stan Riggs, the distinguished university professor from East Carolina University. The rest of our guests pointed to potential problems of a growing population and less water. Stan Riggs knows about too much water in North Carolina's future, sea level rise on our coast. I asked Stan to explain the possible ranges of a rising ocean over the next century. Well, if we go back to the science panel report of 2010 that was produced for the Division of Coastal Management, uh, the 19 scientists that wrote that report, who were all North Carolina scientists who um, had some understanding about sea level rise, uh, we came up with a range uh, from 15 to 18 inches is a low to a, a median uh, range of about 39 inches uh, as a fairly high probability and a potential of 55 inches. But of course, that's based on the assumption that, that it, all the variables continue to happen the same way they have been happening in the past. We have a past record and the sea level projection, prediction, is based on how well we know the past. And so anything can change dramatically uh, outside of that. And so in reality, uh, we could have no change or we could have extreme changes if we had some catastrophic event. Stan also explained the sources of water in a time of elevated sea levels. Well, there's, there's several things that are involved here. Uh, as the 
planet heats up, as the more and more energy is accumulated in the atmosphere, the atmosphere warms, the ocean currents warm, and as the ocean warms, it also expands. So we get a certain amount of, of rise in sea level from just the warming of the water. As we increase the energy storage in the ocean currents, the equatorial current, the Gulf Stream current, we speed those currents up. And the currents are rolling around and it's sort of like going around a corner in your car. You get pulled to the outside. So we'll probably have a slight increase in, in just from the physics of, of the circum ocean current structures it, as they increase in energy and velocity. Uh, but the big uh, elephant in the room is the uh, glacial ice masses in Antarctica and Greenland, as well as some of the glacials, uh, glaciers on, on the mountaintops. But they're a small part. It's the big guys, the important components are what's happening in Greenland and what's happening in Antarctica. Stan Riggs also gave some examples that each of us can understand, explaining how the sea has risen, even in the last couple of hundred years. There are many ways that we measure sea level change. Uh, the one that's most familiar to people is the tide gauge data. Tide gauge data is, is good, but it's only a short little record. Human history is another way that we can tell what kind of changes are taking place. And it goes back, that record goes back much further. For example, we have wharfs. All these villages in eastern North Carolina have always lived by the water. They've always had boats. They have wharves down at the edge of the water. Those wharves, when they were built and being used in the 1700s or the early 1800s, they were above sea level. They were maybe one or two feet. Today, they're still in, some of them are still intact, and, and they're in two to three feet of water. They didn't slide down there, they're attached to land. We have uh, uh, places like Shell Castle Island, where the, uh, which is um, a piece of, uh, of shell mound that's out in uh, near Ocracoke Inlet, where from 1790, a fellow by the name of Wallace and his partner Blunt uh, built this a uh, warehouse uh, to lighter goods off of the ships that were coming into the, through the, into Ocracoke. And uh, he built a warehouse uh, with stone foundations. He built a tavern and four or five houses and a lighthouse out there. And that was active from 1790 to 1820. And uh, they have a history uh, of extensive history of activities out there, and it was well above water. It was, and today, it's still there, the foundations are there, but they're in several feet of water again. The shorelines are moving. They're moving dramatically, and, and the way you know that they're moving is when you build a highway on the barrier islands, for example, and you build that highway in the 50s, and you've got uh, 500 feet of beach out there between you and the ocean, but by 1980, you, you only have 10 feet. Change is the only constant in our coastal system. It, the, the ocean's going to rezone the land. Well, there's a lot of land out here that, that's good for development. Let's develop that land and let's let some land that's not good for development, but it's good for ecotourism, let's build an economy around that. And it's a, it's a matter of thinking better about the resources we have and how they work. Rising sea levels have already begun to impact drinking water supplies on our coast. Amy Pickle explains. In coastal North Carolina, there is a salt wedge that is working its way up the Cape Fear and getting closer and closer to intakes on that river and likely impacting other coastal intakes up and down eastern North Carolina. So that saltwater wedge is very similar to the impact that we are likely to see from sea level rise where you have a primarily saline environment working its way into our freshwater drinking supply in the state. 
When you spend time around Stan Riggs, you realize that he sees not just challenges and change, but great opportunity for North Carolina's coast in the coming years. What's really critical is to be talking about it, to have an educated public, to have ed educated leadership before the Hurricane Sandy hits us and cleans the clock. So we don't have the disasters. We can minimize. We never get rid of storms, but we can minimize the impact of those storms by being smarter. And in many respects, we're already doing this in a gentle way. Uh, but I think we, we can't keep thinking that there's unlimited growth potential out here in the old-fashioned way. Status quo, that kind of development isn't going to make it. But, but people will come from the, all around the world to visit this, this system. This is a world-class coastal system, unequaled anywhere. Water, too much or too little, will affect jobs and economic growth in the future, whether you live on the coast or in the mountains. Amy Pickle, Jim Salzman and Bill Ross all leave us with some final thoughts. Economic growth is such a critical um, component of how we think about good policy in North Carolina. So let's take an anecdote. A major industry wants to move to North Carolina. Let's say it's not a particularly water intensive industry, but they really, it's a, it's a, a sector that appreciates a, a particular style of life, a quality of life that North Carolina can currently offer. So places to go kayaking, places to canoe, ways to get out and enjoy our abundant resources, natural resources. All of those natural resources are dependent on water. So when an employee um, is hired in this particular company or they bring somebody in from other state who wants to live and, and make a life here in North Carolina, they're looking for those high quality of life areas. And North Carolina can certainly offer that. Without water, we won't have that ability to offer that quality of life. So I mean, it's, it's no exaggeration to say that water is life. You look at any civilization throughout history and they had very sophisticated water engineering for their time. You cannot have a settled community without access to adequate water and safe water. And it's as true today as it was in ancient Egypt. And so the question for us is, going forward, how are we going to ensure that that happens? And that comes down to one word, and that word is infrastructure. We need to make the investments now to make sure we can store the water and treat it and get it to where it needs to go. Water is life. It's the briny broth of our origins, the pounding circulatory system of the world, a precarious molecular edge on which we survive. So what should we take away from the story of water in North Carolina? It is one with challenge, but it is also a story filled with opportunities. Compared with other states and other nations, we have much to celebrate, but even more to build on. I learned this while exploring North Carolina. For additional information about this or other episodes, go to these websites. Exploring North Carolina is made possible by major financial support from DTS Software, Mainframe Storage Management Solutions, This permanent digital record of North Carolina's natural heritage will be used in schools and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences for generations to come because of the generous financial support of the members of State Employees Credit Union. Exploring North Carolina is produced in partnership with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, the largest natural sciences museum in the Southeast. Let it be your field guide to the treasures of North Carolina and beyond. and by UNC-TV viewers like you.